Uh, welcome to the Mobilize and Restore Center uh, webinar series. And thanks to you, uh, those of you that have continued on from the research talk. Uh, in this portion of the webinar, our speakers, Scott Oldrich and Antoine Felice, will provide a tutorial for how to set up a, collection, a data collection, uh, access kinematic measures, generate dynamic simulations, and understand the strengths and limitations of OpenCAP. And again, we will take more questions at the end of the tutorial. So again, use the Q&A panel and not the chat, and feel free to enter your questions uh, as they're talking. With that, Scott and Antoine, please feel free to go ahead and start the tutorial. All right, so let's move on to the tutorial part of the webinar. So we have two main learning objectives for today. First, we want you to learn how to get the best quality data, where to go for documentation, and how to troubleshoot. Second, we want you to learn how to access kinematic measures and how to generate muscle-driven simulations to access dynamic measures. But also, we want you to learn about the strengths and limitations of OpenCAD. So importantly, today's goal is not to get you started with OpenCAP. It's more to get you, try to get you more intuition about how OpenCAP is working so that you can obtain best quality data. For introductory material about OpenCAP, we encourage you to watch our tutorial videos on the OpenCAP website. So let's start with the first objective. There are three different parts of OpenCAP you can optimize to obtain best quality data. These include the camera setup, the camera calibration and the data collection itself. So when starting a session on the web application, you will be prompted to scan a QR code to mount the camera to a tripod and to position the camera such as to capture the volume of interest. So here is a short video that describes how to optimize the positioning of your cameras in a narrow hallway. So try to position the camera such as to maximize the spread between them. Then you can visualize the field of view for each camera and adjust the position of the camera. So here you would want to align the right edge of the field of view with the left side of the subject. Next, you want to move on to the other camera and proceed in a similar way. So align the left edge of the field of view with the right side of the subject. Make sure you take some margin into account in case the subject is moving to the right or to the left. When done, practice the activity you're planning to capture. So here, walking, and make sure the subject is visible by at least two cameras at all time. So this video is mainly for capturing gate data, but you can work in a very similar way for any type of activity. All right, so as I said during the, the video, at least two cameras must see all body parts at all times. So practice the activity while visualizing the field of view. Also, it is fine to have the participants enter the field of view while recording, but you should not have them re-enter the field of view after exiting. Finally, we recommend avoiding views that are too sagittal. So in addition to inducing a lot of occlusion, they might lead to poor pose estimation results. So here you can see an example um, on this image open pose is a little bit confused between the right and the left legs when they cross each other during walking. This typically does not happen when the cameras are not as sagittal. A couple of tips that are related to your setup and to the algorithms of OpenCAP. So first make sure the participant is the largest person in the field of view. So it's fine to have multiple persons in the scene as in the picture, as long as the largest person across the entire time sequence corresponds to the participant. So in this context, the size of the person is the size of the associated bounding box. The larger the box, the larger the person. So you see here that the participant is much larger than the experimenter, so OpenCAP can handle that uh, very well. Also try to use contrast. It's not uh, a requirement and the pose estimation algorithms are robust. Uh, but we notice that it helps to have contrasts. So for instance, here you see that open pose fail to properly identify the foot. Uh, it's hard to exactly know why, but we suspect that the black straps on the black floor might have uh, contributed to the failure, but also the fact that the socks and the shoes of the same color might have, have, uh, might have, might have contributed to the failure as well. All right. so. After setting up your cameras and optimizing your environment, you will be prompted on the web application to calibrate the cameras using a checkerboard. So please watch the tutorial video dedicated to cali camera calibration on our website. 
just a few additional tips. Uh, make sure you position the checkerboard close to where the participant will perform the activity. The further away, the checkerboard, the less, the less accurate the data might be because of slight inaccuracies in the camera parameters. Also make sure the checkerboard is mounted to a flat surface like a plexiglass sheet. So next, make sure the checkerboard is perpendicular to the floor. If it's not, then the floor in the simulation world will not correspond to the real floor, as you can see here. It doesn't really matter in terms of uh, joint angles because it's all relative. But when you look at kinetics or so forces, very different forces will be applied to the model depending on the floor orientation. Finally, make sure that the normal to the checkerboard is not pointing right at the camera. So the normal is this line coming out of the checkerboard and perpendicular to the checkerboard. So to do so, avoid having the camera at the exact same height as the checkerboard and facing uh, straight, let's say, the checkerboard. This will create ambiguity and this might affect your results. To avoid that, you can move the checkerboard up, left, right, or down. All right, so after calibrating your cameras, you will see this uh, screen on the web application. You will be prompted to collect data from a neutral pose. So why do we want you to do that? Well, the neutral pose is used to scale a musculoskeletal, musculoskeletal model to the anthropometry of the participant. So as I mentioned in the first part of the webinar, we're using OpenSIM as our modeling and simulation platform. And we're using the scaling tool of OpenSIM to scale the model based on the anthropometry of the participants. So you can find more information about scaling in the documentation of OpenSIM. So there are a few important remarks we'd like to make here. Uh, the scaling tool assumes that the participant will take a neutral pose, uh, a certain pose. This is why we ask you to uh, follow the pose in the example pictures. So in particular, we will assume that your hips, your knees, and your back are straight and that you're not flexing your ankles. So we recommend having the arms slightly abducted, but it's not an assumption used by the scaling tool. It's more to help the pose estimation algorithm to distinguish your arms from the rest of your body. Finally, some comments about failure modes. Scaling might fail because the pose estimation failed. This typically happens if the subject is too close to the cameras. Scaling might also fail if the participant is not static. So if the scaling failed multiple times, this might be a camera calibration problem. So make sure you follow our camera calibration instructions and restart a new session. So when recording data from the neutral pose, you might notice that you have the option to select two different pose estimation models, open pose and H or next. So we recommend using open pose, but mainly because it is faster. HRNet might be more robust in certain cases. So for instance, taking by this example of open pose failing to properly identify both legs from a sagittal view during walking, you can see here that HRNet on the right-hand side does not fall. So we recommend testing HRNet if you're not satisfied with open pose. As I mentioned, HRNet is a little slower uh, and it's better so suited for short trials. It tends actually to fail on longer trials. So now you have scaled your model and you should see a screen similar to this one on the web application. This is another chance to visualize the field of view. As you can see the video is recorded for the neutral pose on the right hand side of the screen. If at this point your model does not look right, something must have gone wrong and you might want to restart a new session. If it looks good, then you can start collecting dynamic trials. So we have two tutorial videos on the website that describes that describe how to collect data over ground and on treadmill. So please have a look. So before we move on to discussing how to analyze your data, I'd like to describe, to describe how the cameras are time synchronized. It's a very crucial part of OpenCAM. So the cameras are not hard synced. They will start recording videos within about one second of synchrony. We then use the key points identified by the pose estimation models to perfectly synchronize the recorded videos. So to ensure a good synchronization, make sure the participant is in all camera views for about two seconds. 
So we have developed uh, three algorithms for synchronizing the videos. First, if a hand raise is detected, we will use the vertical velocity of uh, the hand key point for synchronization. If no hand raise is detected, we will identify whether the activity is a gate trial or not. To do so, we look at whether the feet are moving in or out of place. If gate is detected, then we use the cross correlation of the foot key point speeds for synchronization. If gate is not detected, then we use the cross correlation of all marker vertical speeds for synchronization. So we recommend using the hand raise approach for uh, subtle or slow movements like balance tasks for all activities uh, taking place on a treadmill and for complex tasks where the other approaches might fail. So overall, this hand raised approach is the fail safe approach. And on that, I would like to hand over to Scott, who's going to talk about the second learning objective of the day. Great. So now that we have successfully collected data, I will walk through the different tools that we have available in OpenCAP to analyze and process your data, both your kinematics, so your joint angles, and going all the way to your dynamics. So first, let's get a feel for what the, the OpenCAP ecosystem actually is. So like we've mentioned before, OpenCAP is powered by OpenSim under the hood. And there's a few different ways of interacting with it. We've talked extensively about how to use our web application where you perform data collection, but there's also a dashboard to analyze some simple kinematic measures. So this would be your joint angles. But perhaps you want to take it a step further and analyze something like the muscle tendon unit lengths, which are only dependent upon kinematics. We have provided a Google Colab, which is written in, in Python, it's a Jupyter Notebook, and um, this can enable you to do slightly deeper kinematic analyses. And this uses a GitHub repository, which we'll refer to several times. It's on our Stanford Nimble account called OpenCAP Processing. So perhaps you want to um, go a step even further and perform kinetic analyses. You can do this using the same GitHub repository, but this would be performed on your local machine. And finally, if you want to dig into the details of how we go from the videos to the kinematics, our repository called OpenCAP Core has all of the code that's currently running in the cloud um, to, to power the cloud-based solution. And we'll talk about why you might want to do this in a moment. So we'll start with analyzing data first in the web application, which is the simplest way to do it um, and, and the easiest way to, to start parsing through your results. So say you've collected this nice treadmill trial of walking and you'd like to plot the knee angle. You can click on the analysis dashboard button and it will take you to this session. You can select the particular trial. And then here you can select your x-axis to be time and your y-axis to be your knee angle. Once you click generate plot, the plot will show up and you can zoom in to see a few gate cycles and you can scroll over to find particular values. You can even print uh, this plot and save it. So I'd like to highlight right now what something we're going to call the session identifier. This is an important way to identify um, the particular data collection session. So we, we recommend writing this down next to other identifiers you might have for a particular session, just so you have a good mapping between who the participant was, what the conditions were in the session. Um, this is a, a, a long randomly generated string that you'll use to interact with our, um, with our database in the upcoming examples. Okay, so let's say the kinematics were great to visualize on the dashboard, but again, you wanted to look at something else um, that only depends on kinematics, like a muscle tendon unit length. You can go ahead and use our Google Colab. So this is again available on our GitHub repository. You can run it uh, hosted by, by Google, so it doesn't have to run on your machine. Let's walk through how we can use it. So first you have to install Conda for Colab. It's a, it's a package management tool that allows us to, to install OpenSim. So once you do that, you can clone our repository at the next step. So this clones the repository and installs all of the um, packages that we use for this script. And then you can go ahead and import the particular um, functions. And here is that session identifier that I mentioned earlier. You drop that in and you can, you can analyze a specific session. So here, let's look at the same walking trial we looked at before and then you download the data. And so this is pulling the data down from the database so the Google Colab can access it. 
And you can see, you can find this, this data um, in the OpenCAP processing data folder under the session identifier, there's marker data, and there's also the OpenSim kinematic and model data. So now that it's downloaded, we're gonna go ahead and compute some specific terms. So we have this class called utils kinematics that has a, a variety of functions. So you can view the source code directly out of the collab. We won't go into it, but if you wanna know exactly what all the uh, functions within the class do, you could do that. So you can just get the coordinate values. Those are the join angles. You can get speeds and accelerations, but using the OpenSim API, we can calculate these other things like muscle tendon unit lengths or moment arms. And we can look at the center of mass, values, speeds, and accelerations. So when we click run, we compute all of these things from the kinematics that were previously calculated for this trial. So let's go ahead and plot things. So here, let's just look at the same knee angle plot that we were able to generate on the dashboard. The code here was for several different trials and a few different parameters. So we're just modifying the, um, these lists here to look at only the knee angle for the single trial. And you can change the axes, labels, and titles. Okay, so when you press go, we can go ahead and generate the same kinematic plot that we were able to see in the dashboard. But the real reason you would probably want to use this is to, to get to the deeper kinematics. So here, let's look at the muscle tendon unit length of the gastric nemius for only the one trial name that we've downloaded. Here we have the muscle tendon unit length and you can see it's periodic like the, uh, like the several gait cycles that we recorded. And finally, you can download whatever data you've processed in this collab. Um, for example, we could download the coordinate speeds and it'll put it in your OpenSim data kinematics and output folder. You'll get a CSV of all of the data that you computed in this notebook. Okay, so those are ways to, to analyze kinematic data in different parts of the, the musculoskeletal model as it moves through different poses. Let's talk about um, how and when we might want to go ahead and, and run the OpenCAP core uh, repository locally. So sometimes when you might want to do this, um, you can run open pose with higher accuracy settings. We've optimized the settings that are running in the cloud to be accurate um, when the person is, is both quite far away from the camera. So when they're small, um, which requires a, a slightly slower and higher accuracy algorithm, um, we've optimized it for that as well as computation speed. But there's an even higher accuracy setting that you could run locally that takes quite a bit more time and requires a high power GPU. So times when you, you might think to do this is if you have um, the participant is far from the camera and you have kinematic results that don't look great, if you were to reprocess them using the high accuracy settings, you'll get a better, uh, you, you might get some better kinematics like you see on the right. Another reason to do this is to, to debug your capture setup um, and you can start to understand what, what failure modes might be. So um, it can be challenging when you just see the kinematics to understand if synchronization was failing or pose detection. So when you run this locally, the key points are overlaid on the video. So you can go ahead and watch your videos and see if the key points are able to be detected um, by open pose. And this will help you optimize your setup to, um, to improve problems that might be happening there, or if perhaps it's using the wrong synchronization algorithm. And finally, you can use this um, open source repository to customize your algorithms. Perhaps you have some activity specific settings you would like to modify, or you'd like to use a different OpenSIM model than we're using um, in the web-based approach. This would be a great place to do that. And we encourage you to contribute your improvements back to the repository. Okay, so those are different ways that we can, we can look at kinematics, we can reprocess our, our data from video, and finally, let's look at how we could do a kinetic analysis using the OpenCAP processing repository. So we might want to do this if we want to look at the forces generated by the muscles, the joint moments, or the ground reaction forces. So to do this, I'll describe briefly the dynamic simulation problem formulation um, that, that we use to get these dynamics. So we use a modified Rajagopal model using OpenSim. And we have 40 muscle tendon actuators per leg, and we have a torque actuated upper body. And we model the contact with the floor using smooth hunt cross leg contact spheres. We solve an optimal control problem that's objective is to track the video-based kinematics. 
So our, our design variables that we're solving for are the muscle excitations and the torque actuator controls. In our cost function, we're, we're trying to minimize the tracking error between the kinematics that we measured from, uh, from the video and the simulations kinematics, as well as the squared error or the squared effort terms of all the actuators. And this is subject to some constraints um, like the skeletal dynamics, the muscle dynamics, as well as the, a few task specific constraints. Now, the reason we, we need some task specific constraints and occasionally some task specific objective terms is that people aren't using the same objective for every task. So the, the human um, neural control objective is not necessarily the same when you're trying to dunk a basketball versus walk. And so we need to encode this into the optimization. So an example for, for how we did this in our study is when you're performing a squat, you're not necessarily trying to minimize energy, which is, um, which is what's showing up in these actuator effort squared term, but you're told to keep your heels on the ground. And so we added a constraint into the problem that you have to perform the squat in a way that your heels remain in contact with the ground. So some tips for the kinetics, and we, we have much more documentation and, and more tips on our GitHub repository. Uh, but these optimal control problems rely on a number of assumptions, some of which I just mentioned. So there's infinite numbers of an infinite number of ways to satisfy the problem constraints. And so the solution is quite sensitive to the cost terms and how you weight those terms. And like I mentioned, it's hard to control to capture the control strategy into the cost function in a task agnostic way. So that's to say it's it's really hard to have a single problem formulation for any activity. So it's important to verify your solution, make sure it makes sense. And, and uh, best case before you perform a large out of lab study is to validate it against um, in lab measures. Another thing to remember, these, these are detailed musculoskeletal models. The, the muscle models are quite complicated. There's 80 muscles. And so the, these become quite computationally expensive problems. And unlike other optimization techniques like static optimization, for example, where you, you solve every step um, in time one at a time, this is a solution over the entire time interval. So the longer of an interval you attempt to simulate, the bigger the problem gets and the slower it will be to solve. So we recommend splitting your motion into two second segments, really focusing on the portion of interest and maybe having a 0.3 second buffer on either side of that portion of interest. Maybe you really care about five seconds of the motion, we would still recommend splitting it up into several different segments. The last thing to remember is these models are well, they're models. And so all of the outputs here are, are really estimations. The muscles are generic, the contact models are generic. And so this doesn't change between your, your subjects, what type of shoes they're wearing, that kind of thing. So it's again, important to verify your solution. So we validated this approach for four different tasks in our, in our paper. And there's no guarantee that it will work uh, the same for other activities or even in totally different conditions for the same activity. So it's very important, like I mentioned, to validate for your particular application. Now, that's the best practice for research, but we have used this formulation across a variety of different activities that aren't in the paper. For example, we have examples for running, and they do work quite well. So we believe it's, it's a quite uh, flexible framework, but it's, a, again, important to validate for what you'd like to study. So how are we solving these optimal control problems? In the paper, we used a tool called OpenSim AD, which is OpenSim with support for automatic differentiation, which makes the gradient computations quite a bit faster. Now, the benefit here, again, is, is the speed, but perhaps you'd like to use a different model than the one that, that, we've, that we're using in OpenCAP. And if you'd like to do that, we recommend that you use OpenCAP, OpenSim MoCo instead, which is another uh, direct collocation package that is um, embedded in OpenSim, and it's much more flexible in terms of which model you use. Uh, but it does not support automatic differentiation. So um, in, the, in the tasks that we've looked at, it's, it's solved quite a bit slower. Okay, so let's look at how we might actually go ahead and generate one of these dynamic simulations. So you'll see that I've cloned the OpenCAP processing repository to my disk. I'm gonna go ahead and open up the example kinetics file which allows us to run these simulations. So there's a few inputs that you'll have, the session identifier, which we've talked about, the trial name, so that might be a walking trial, and the motion type. So we have settings for a variety of motions, including running, walking, jumping, sit to stands, and others. But if you'd like to simulate a different activity, we have an other setting that has a very general problem formulation. And you can see all of the settings under the hood in a file called settings open sim AD. And you could even create settings for your own activity in this particular file. 
So other things you need to specify for the simulation would be the time window that you're trying to simulate. And for some activities like sit to stands that are repetitive, we have automatic segmentation of when to start and stop. So you just need to specify which repetition you're interested in. So we'll get, go ahead and simulate um, some tasks from the same session that we had before. And these are overground as opposed to treadmill, which just means that the ground is moving. So here's the session identifier. And let's go ahead and simulate a sit to stand here. And if you, if you look down in the trial uh, for the details for trials that are sit to stand, uh, we'll use the sit to stand settings and we'll go ahead and simulate the first repetition of the sit to stand. So you can go ahead and save this. You could run it. Oh, before that, um, for other activities that don't have the automatic segmentation, you can specify the time window like you can see for a jump here. So we can save the file and we could, we could run it right here in Spider, or we could run it in the, uh, in the terminal, which we'll go ahead and do. So you just type Python example kinetics.py. It initializes and you'll start to see the um, optimization iterations appear on the screen in a minute here. So this problem takes around five minutes to solve. We'll fast forward to the end and show you what you get after a successful simulation. So it found an optimal solution. You can find your um, objective value at the end of the solution, as well as the contributions of the different cost terms um, to that final objective. And this took 415 iterations to solve. Now we could go ahead and look at our data in OpenSim. So here I'm, I'm um, loading up the model so we can visualize our results. So we've got our model and then we'll go ahead and, and open up our states file, which is gonna have the kinematics as well as the muscle activations. So that's in the dynamics folder. There's a bunch of outputs here. So you have the muscle forces, you have the ground reaction forces. Here's the states file. Here are the joint moments and here are some joint reaction forces. So if we look at just the states, you can see the kinematics and the muscles lighting up um, based on when they're turning on during the squat. So there's quite a bit of documentation um, around generating dynamic simulations generally using OpenSim. And I'd like to just point your attention to those um, as you get into these simulations. So Carmichael Ong recorded an excellent webinar um, helping walk you through which different simulation pipeline you might wanna use depending on your scientific question. And we highly recommend watching this, this webinar. Um, Chris Dembia also gave a nice webinar talking about the OpenSim API, which is um, and, and accessing it from MATLAB and Python, which is how you can do some of these additional analyses, like looking at, at moment arms, for example, from the kinematics. And Chris Dembia and Nick Bianco also recorded a great webinar um, talking about optimal control simulations using OpenSim Moco, um, which is a, a tool that I briefly mentioned. So we highly recommend um, watching this webinar, and we have also provided an OpenSim Moco example in our um, open cap processing repository if you'd like to to try it out using some data you've collected using open cap so at the end we'd just like to point you to a few resources um, we really recommend checking out opencap.ai we have getting started information best practices troubleshooting and tutorial videos um, so this is really a, a great place to, to get going with your data collections if there's things that aren't answered on that website, we, we'd love to have you ask questions on our forum. So you can go to simtk.org and type in OpenCAP in the search bar, you'll find our page and click on the forum. Chances are somebody else may have had your question. They may have answered, asked it, we may have answered it. You can click on it and find your answer very quickly. If they haven't, I'm sure your question will be of use to people in the future. So we encourage you to post it there so we can answer it for everybody else's benefit in the future. And finally, we conduct quarterly office hours through the Mobilize and Restore Center. And if you have um, questions that are very specific to your research question um, or your, your project setup, we'd be happy to do consultation with you and have you sign up for these office hours. So thank you so much for coming to the webinar and, and um, for, for listening. We look forward to questions, but I just want to say a quick thank you to, to other folks who contributed greatly to this, uh, this project in the webinar. So Wukash Kaczynski, and Alberto Casas Ortiz um, helped us dramatically on the uh, front end web development as well as the back end infrastructure of the tool. And Carmichael Ong and Matt Petrucci developed some of the examples in, in MoCo and CoLab that we showed um, and are included in our repository. So finally, if you'd like to join our mailing list, we send out uh, a newsletter about every two or three months with updates on, on new software development. 
um, go ahead and sign up for an account. If you go to opencap.ai and click the start collecting data, you can sign up for an account and you'll be added to our, um, your, or optionally added to our mailing list. So with that, I'll pass it back to Matt for some questions. Okay, great. Thanks, Scott and Antoine. Um, we'll go ahead and switch back to questions, as you mentioned. Um, so we have about eight minutes. If We might go over a little bit, Scott and Antoine, if, if that's all right. We're not going to answer great. them all. We do have 84 questions, so there's quite a few to get through. But I think there's some general areas that some of these questions go through, and we can just kind of like maybe hit some high level uh, uh, things on each of them. So um, I guess uh, just real quick, when you, you did drop out in between um, the um, setting up the field of view, and um, I think you were talking about the optimal angle for different types of of, of trials. So maybe Antoine, uh, if you can touch on that again, I, I, it did break up. I think you were talking about like differences for running versus walking, or like if you're doing a standing squat, how you should have your cameras. And along with that, several, several of the questions that have come up have talked about how many cameras do you need to be accurate and like how big of a field of view can you have with the uh, definition of the cameras that we have uh, in the iOS devices? Yeah, sure. So regarding the, the, the angles, so, the, the thing to keep in mind is try to maximize the spread between the cameras. So we recommend like plus minus 45 degrees angle. It's very good. Um, it shouldn't be too sagittal. Otherwise, you get a lot of occlusion and the pose estimation models do not work as well. So plus minus 45 usually works pretty well for stationary activities like squats or drop jumps, uh, sit to stands. Um, for walking or running, like gait trials, where the, the, the participant is moving forward, it you might want to bring the cameras a little closer to the direction faced by the participants, so maybe plus minus uh, 30 degrees. This will help capture a longer volume, but also this will reduce occlusion uh, that you might have when the legs cross each other. And also when you, for, for gate trials, we, we found out that adding like a third camera uh, facing uh, like fr in a frontal plane might really help to reduce occlusion. So that's something you may want to consider. In terms of the number of cameras, um, in our research uh, paper, like the preprint, you, you can find some detailed results about that. We compared uh, three different configurations, having like two cameras at plus minus 45, three cameras, so adding the, the one uh, facing the, the participant, and five cameras, so having two uh, sag almost sagittal, like plus minus 70 degrees. And we didn't find very large differences in between the, the setups. It was a bit better with five, but not so much. So um, you should get almost the same accuracy with two versus three versus five. Uh, just keep in mind, try to minimize occlusion. So adding a third one might might help. Great. Great. Yep. And so an, another kind of set of questions that could come up and came up in, in multiple ways is, uh, and you kind of touched on it when we're uh, asked when the question came up about Android videos. So if people are using, say, video motion cap capture systems that have multiple videos, and they want to try to use them for open cap, you know, what, what obviously you you've you've put out the, the open cap course, so they can do local processing. But are there any additional things that you would recommend in terms of if they do have that set up, you know, do they you know, should they have certain things in the environment, things like that? Sure. So um, the code, we, it, it's possible to do that, and it would take a little bit of, of um, a little bit of coding to to get the repository in a place where it could do that, and, and we'll release those those soon. Um, there are some things to keep in mind. So if you were to just use the the normal iPhone video or the Android video, it's it's changing its uh, with autofocus, it can change its focal length slightly, so that can can be a challenge. So you have to calculate what's called the intrinsic parameters of the camera. Um, so this is things like um, focal length, principal point position, and distortion. And this is stuff we do, we've done ahead of time for you for all the, the iOS devices. So if you were using new devices, you, we have code that you can, can compute those parameters. Um, but again, you need to, to really fix how the phone is capturing the video so that it's not doing um, autofocus and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I think those are... Those are some of the primary things to think about. It, you know, you, you need to start multiple videos. Um, 
nearly at the same time. So um, that's part of what our iOS application makes makes easy, but you can do that with, with GoPros and things fairly easily as well. And have and, a check, checkerboard. And have, having a checkerboard, yeah. So um, if you have RGB cameras already embedded in like your, your uh, markered motion capture system, then sometimes those are already calibrated and you can take out the calibration parameters that are, that are computed by the software and um, you can use those in OpenCap. And those are should be hard synchronized. So that also makes it easier. Um, we also had several questions about um, bulky clothing or say someone's wearing an exoskeleton or, or other things. Have you had experience with that or you know, have any tips or tricks around that? Um, so we have, we have not tested like extensively with assistive mm -hmm. devices. Um, so there, I think we will rely a lot on the, the pose estimation algorithms themselves. So um, open pose, Ethernet, and the other models out there, they're fairly robust. Uh, so usually they work pretty well, uh, but they're mostly based on the same data sets. So they were trained using this COCO data set, uh, and it's also limited. So if you go out of the distribution of the activities that were in the da data set or, or the type of participants, um, they might, they might struggle and you this will sort of propagate into open cap. So yeah, that's the first part of the answer. The second part is that we, we built open cap to be very modular. So you could you can use open post, you can use HR, HRNet, and you could use another model if you wanted to. So for instance, if you're interested in um, in uh, prosthesis, assistive devices, maybe you want to use deep lab cuts where you can um, sort of better tune what you want to what you want to identify. So uh, you would need to do a bit of coding and look into the source code, how, how we uh, designed that, but that's definitely a, a possibility. Great. And it kind of stemming off that, there've been several questions about, you know, other movements such as like upper limb movements, or say you are doing like a sports movement that's highly dynamic. Do, are you needing to like retrain the models or anything like that? But it, it sounds like that may come down to what pose estimation you're using or, uh, or maybe you can speak to that a little bit. Yeah, so we um, there's a, a lot of considerations if you're doing something something highly dynamic and an upper extremity movement. So we validated on on drop jumps, and um, we are which is is a quite dynamic lower extremity motion. And we we're collecting the video at 60 hertz. Um, we we have plans to enable people to collect at higher um, higher frequencies in the future. Um, so if you if you need um, you know 300 hertz or something like that. That's, that's definitely a consideration. As far as the upper extremity, um, it's our vision that OpenCap is, is able to support different models in the future. So, so our model is, is, is more detailed in the lower extremity as you saw than it is in the upper. And it's able to characterize the kinematics of the upper extremities pretty well um, insofar as they, or as they affect the, the dynamics in the, in the lower extremity. But if you really care deeply about you know, shoulder kinematics, we only have a three, three degree of freedom shoulder model. So you might want to um, use a different model. And, and for now, before we integrated all these different models, a nice way to access that is that when you download your data, you get the TRC file. So this has all the marker positions. So you could, this is exactly what you would, would feed into OpenSim normally for inverse kinematics. So you could take this, this marker data with a different model and just run it through OpenSim pipelines that way. That's great. That was, I was going to say there were several questions about swapping in different models and, and how you would go about that. So you would recommend doing the loading back into OpenSim and, and track. Yep. Okay, great. Um, maybe just to touch on how long of trials uh, would you reckon? Uh, is there an upper bound? Probably. I mean, obviously, the longer the trials are, it's going to take longer to process, but uh, maybe a a, a recommendation on, on length of trial? Yeah, so for now, uh, there is an upper bound on what you, you can collect. So it's limited to like one minute per trial. But we, we recommend like splitting trials in, in like shorter, in sub trials, so to speak. Um, it will make like the processing faster, but also if you want to go to the dynamics, in any case, you will need to, to simulate for shorter trials. Uh, in terms of how long it takes, um, like for instance, the neutral pose is uh, it's timed to like two seconds and it takes about like, uh, let's say 10 to 15 seconds to process per video. So if you have like two cameras, maybe 30 seconds. 
Uh, if you record like a one minute trial, then you, you're almost like, like, I think at like three minutes per video. So it might take, it might take a long time. And if uh, many users are using OpenDCAP at the same time and they're all recording one minute trials, then you might wait, need to wait a long time before the trial gets processed. Definitely. Okay. Um, so I think actually that hits a lot of the, the higher points in terms of the questions that, that have come in. Um, I think that we could actually potentially wrap up here. And actually, as I mentioned earlier, um, we will download the Q&A afterwards and answer the questions after uh, afterwards, and they'll be posted on the website. So to, don't worry if, if I didn't get to your question here live, uh, we will have it answered uh, after the fact. But uh, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, and thank you, uh, Scott and Antoine, for excellent talk and, and presenting the tool. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for the, the great questions that have rolled in. Um, so please be sure to uh, click on the link that will appear at the conclusion of the webinar and take our survey. Uh, that'll help us improve the webinar series and choose upcoming topics. Uh, this uh, webinar series is supported by two grants from the NIH, including the grants that support the Mobilize Center and the Restore Center. Uh, we're grateful for the support which allows us to run these webinars and events. And uh, we wanna thank everyone for uh, your participation today. and. Uh, we hope you'll continue to stay involved with our centers and we look forward to seeing you in a future webinar so have a great day thanks everyone thanks